Good day, everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, whatever time zone you're joining us from. Thank you for coming on to this session of uh, another Microsoft Reactor live stream event. Today we are excited to have Suzanne George um, joining us and presenting Make the Shift to Business Focused Solutions. Um, if this is your first time joining us, please note that our team's live event sessions usually have about a 20 second delay between the speaker talking to the audience. So feel free to post questions in the chat. Suzanne will remind you throughout if questions are coming up just to put them in there. Um, and note that this, our speaker Suzanne may not respond straight away. Just one because of the delay and also just as she's flowing through her presentation, but she will be checking in sporadically and answering as she goes. And then at the conclusion of the presentation. There as well. Um, additionally, please be aware that we will be recording this session and then posting it to our YouTube channel, which I will share the link to our YouTube in the chat momentarily. Um, yeah, and then again, thank you so much for being a part of this. We are always striving to provide wonderful content to our community. At the end of the session, I'm going to send out a survey link, which we ask if you are available, if you are able to just fill it out and submit it. We use that uh, for developing our future content. Thank you so much. Now I'll pass it over to Suzanne. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I am super excited to chat with you today and talk to you really about how you as part of your organization or if you're a consultant, how can you help organizations really make the shift to what we're calling business focused solutions? You'll hear Microsoft say low code, no code, right? And how do we deliver those kinds of solutions in this new era, right? How do we find those the right opportunities? How do we make sure that we're developing in the right way? I mean, as you can imagine, we used to, from the IT perspective, be able to throw things over the fence and say, oh, here, this is your application, go use it, and 50,000 bookmarks and 4,000 applications and go figure it out. And business just said, hey, that's not going to work. So today we're going to really talk about, you know, how do you make the shift to being able to go to a low code, no code, and what does it mean using the Microsoft technologies that we have available to us? So the first thing I want to do is just real quick introduce myself. Um, again, thank you, Rebecca, for inviting me to this session. You can find me on Twitter. At, uh, my Twitter is SPGenie. I don't do a lot of tweeting, but I do answer questions that come through that way if you want to go ahead and direct message me. I am a chief architect at Cognizant, and I also lead the North American business, business competency around modern workplace. So we do everything around collaboration and you know, enabling technologies such as Teams and Power Platform and Yammer and Planner and Stream and everything else that comes with the Office 365 suite. And not only that, but how do you leverage those AI and cognitive services applications, for example, from Azure? Uh, personally, I have a garden. I'm always out in my garden and I make uh, cupcakes when I get an opportunity, although I think everybody in my household has got a moratorium on cupcakes because I'll make the same kind like five times and they're like done with the you know, red velvet at this point. Um, lastly, I do have a passion for Office 365 and all things Microsoft and I am from Texas. So if you're ever in the neighborhood, whenever we get to travel again, be sure to look me up when you get uh, close to where we are. So today we're going to talk about the major elements that I see that are contributing to what we think of as low code, no code or business focused applications. And it all starts with a couple of major elements. One is organizations and even the world at large are undergoing what we call a cultural change. People, especially millennials and even, you know, you know, uh, older people, older, you know, you know, employees or they're all thinking about how can I do things differently? There's this element of really change and how can I impact that change? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then alongside, as you can imagine, the technology is changing as quickly as the cultural changes are happening. So and how does all that impact IP, IT? Excuse me. And then what are those pillars of success? How can I say, OK, I think I'm in a good place. What does that mean to me? And then obviously, if you have any follow up questions, we'll be able to come off mute ask those questions, but I will be, um, as Rebecca said, going through and saying, hey, look, give me some questions as we move along, should you have any. So let's talk just a little bit about cultural change. And if you can imagine business organizations, even 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 
each company, each in, you know organization had a culture and they said, this is how we do things. This is our, that when you come to be an employee with us, you need to conform to what we have to say and our values and attitudes that we put forth into our products defines what you do and what you bring to the organization. So one of the first things that would happen is, hey, do you fit in our culture? Do you align with our values? And now the new model of building, you know, organizations has kind of turned it completely upside down. They're asking employees, what can you bring to the table? What are you actually being able to do, you know, bring unique? What's unique about you to help us move forward and drive our, you know, success? And that, as a result, is going to help us understand these are some of the values and attitudes that we have around this specific um, department or group that you're within, which is also going to help define the culture. So as you can imagine, there, there's a lot of different organizations out there. Some are very business friendly, some are very millennial focused, you know, some are very, um, you know, forward thinking, they work from home, some are in the office. And now with COVID, everything is kind of turned upside down. And what you bring to the table is now really important. And employees want to contribute. They want to have an impact and they want to help be a part of the culture and define success of the organization. But when we're building applications, we have to allow that individuality, if you will, come through. So some of the things that we need to do is when we're thinking about building applications and when we're thinking about enabling technologies in the Microsoft platform and the Microsoft stacks, we have to start with the question of who is John, for example? Who is the person that I'm actually building for and what are his specific needs? We call this persona development and it's really important. If you're building something in 24 hours or if you're taking six months, you have to understand who it is because before we used to have this maybe even five years ago the buzzword was personalization we're going to personalize the application well now we have to think of it different we have to think of individualization if you will how do we bring this application to an individual and get them excited about using it and no an it organization cannot touch 300,000 people in their uh, company but you can touch certain personas and you can make them feel like, hey, look, I understand what you do. I understand your pain points. You are a salesperson. You're always on your phone. You're always on your mobile device or maybe you're a, a manufacturing plant worker and you don't get a device at all, right? How do we reconcile what do you have and what do you not have and what is the easiest way for you to be able to meet and connect with other people and connect with the data that's important, which is the new word or not really the new word, the, the word collaboration. What needs do you have? How do you need to interact with other people and how do you initiate and how do people find you within the organization? So just like people, right? People want to be able to empower and people want to be able to, you know, be, um, you know, a part and in included in the companies as, a, as an organization, technology is also rapidly changing. If you can imagine, right? Hey, you know, in 1800s, we got the telephone and then we got a man on the moon in the 1900s. And now we, we're, you see the line, it just went completely straight up that says we are exponentially now delivering new technologies and IT is the one that is having to try to figure out well how do I manage all of that but technology also has a personality it has a role to play exactly like a person and that is technology is now more diverse right I have Azure stacks I have um, you know power user stacks power platform stacks I have office desktop stacks and everybody is going to use it in a different way some on their mobile phone and some on the plane like me when, when we were able to fly and some are in the back office and some are on the plant floor right everyone has a different need and the technologies that we're bringing to the table are different for everyone smart badges smart phones tablets everything right and the technology also enables us to contribute. It also says, hey, data is here. I can contribute to your decision that you're making and I can do that in a proactive way, especially with some of the new Azure stuff. See a little bit about that in just a minute. But not only that, that data, if you start with that first line worker, which is your person out on the platform or your salesperson and you get them engaged with the technology, 
your organization is going to be able to bring a 365 degree view of what is happening. So when something like what recently happened in March around COVID and everyone was sent home and there was a big concern, what is the health and well-being of my, my employees first and foremost? But yet, how is that going to impact my bottom line? And the data is now able to, with the technologies, predict, hey, in Texas, your your performance and your, your budgets and your meeting those budgets are going to be good. Maybe in New York, it's maybe a little bit of a slip. Maybe in California, it's, you know, right along the middle. It's, it's you're not going to exceed your budget. You're not going to, re, you know, not meet your budget. So these data elements are now able to be smart and they're able to contribute to overall strategy. And we have to think of data in that way. It is able to help influence not only the uh, nor you know the, the back office worker or the, the power user or the administrator, but it can also influence and inform executives as well. And last, it can help to redefine and define success, right? How you're using your technology technology, who's using it, right? One of the big concerns, right, especially right now when organizations are trying to say, what do I need to do to save? How can I ensure that I'm getting ROI out of everything is how do we manage to understand what shadow IT is and how do we build a reporting around what is people, what are people using and what are not people using, right? If or Office 365 is our platform, we want to put up all, all of our files there and our documents there. And you can do reporting that says this department is using Office 365 very well. This department is not. We need to understand why not, because maybe they have a whole nother shadow IT application that they're using that we need to bring on board and help educate and enable them into the uh, Microsoft Office 365 platform, for example. So the suite of Microsoft stuff is huge and it grows by the day. I don't even think this is the, the whole picture. But what I wanted to impart on you is to the, all of these elements, all these pieces here, they have what are now called low code, no code solution components that are going to enable you to quickly and rapidly build applications that are going to help service your customers. And I think COVID has been the most important example of this because I can just story after story. Hey, somebody came to me with an urgent need. I had to get it out in 24 hours. I was able to do so using a combination of the Power Platform, Teams, or Dynamics, or AI, or Azure Services, or the Healthcare Cloud that was just launched today at Ignite. So all of these things are, are enabling us to quickly respond to business needs and allow us to deliver applications at the speed of business, not at the speed of IT. And in fact, we had one customer come to us and say, look, I need you to help us out because our IT, we know we're too slow. We know there's a way to get there faster. We don't know what that way is. We just need you to come in. Literally 48 hours, we have a, um, a meeting with a, a client and we've got to get this application up. It's crucial for our ability to respond to a need for our customer. We we're able to deliver that in literally 48 hours and it was it, it was a success. And it was a success because we understood the landscape and the tool bag that we had to work with. So if we can really think about these business focused applications, such as retail applications or marketing applications or customer services, and how do we redefine sales, right? You can do a lot of this with literally a couple of clicks and get them started and really thinking about what we call MVP, which is minimum viable product, which is let's get something out. Let's let them touch it. Let's get them feel it. And then let's go expand and augment and expand and augment over time as needs require. So we don't implement the whole solution. We implement it small chunks and you have this tool suite that's going to help you get there. Now let's think about this from for a moment from the user's perspective. What do users like to do when they want to get work done? And we're talking primarily the back office here. Where, if you think about it in a couple of different categories, the first is where do I do my personal work? These are some of the tools that you're going to be able to use and leverage and build in add-ins and Office Outlook add-ins, Word add-ins, Windows 10 applications, those kinds of things that are really going to help me get my own job done and keep myself organized. But the next thing that I need to be able to do as a user is 
how do I help work with my team? This is what we call them we scenarios. It's where I have a small group of people. We need to collaborate. We need to organize. We need to co-author. We need to chat. We need to have meetings. This is where we call team work happens, right? It's the we scenarios. And then finally, it's hey, I need to shout to the world within the organization that says, hey, everyone, this is what I need. This is what is authoritative. This is coming down from the CEO, CIO, those important elements, announcements, events, especially if you have volunteering or other types of organizational things. It's where you can just say, hey, look, you know, organization, I have this or this is available to you. Why don't you come take a look? So when you're thinking about your applications, really try to understand what is the audience where the work is getting done. Does it need to be me or is it something where we have to go we where I'm going to have to collaborate with data. I'm going to have to collaborate with other people. I'm going to have to collaborate inside the organization, outside the organization. What are my security requirements when we turn into a we? And then am I just announcing something? Is it something more authoritative? what that might be and how do we handle that with the us so this will help you kind of guide your application development and help you understand maybe what kinds of tools you want to really focus in on as you start working through building your apps another way to think of this is really how do we take it even to the next level and there are different kinds of what we call experiences that we can bring to the table because maybe you're saying hey this is really great but what are some examples that I can do that are going to help me build what we call experiences and everything that we do is really revolving around an experience. It's a user experience. It's a customer experience. It's an employee experience and all of these kinds of experiences we want people to feel connected with because if you remember way back at the, one of the beginning slides, we really talked about, hey, what is a persona and what does it mean to be individual? will and feel a connection so that I want to use the app so that I don't go to shadow IT and don't use you know my text messaging to do confidential data. I feel very comfortable that it's easy for me to use the tools that have been provided. So some of the things that you might want to think about as you begin the elevation of productivity as it relates to what we call experiences is what kinds of interactions can I have with my customers? How do my employees connect with my customers? Teams has Microsoft virtual agents. There's the healthcare cloud. There's all these different kind of connections, especially go take a look at Ignite. Lots and lots of new um, announcements happening today and tomorrow. So take a look at how we can really connect our salespeople to their, their um, customers so that they can begin reconnecting because remember salespeople are, are one of the, the groups that's really affected by a whole work from home because they they're used to you know traveling they're used to having conversations face to face and how can we bring that same kind of experience to them when it's virtual other things that you might want to think about are self-service items right how can i change my password automatically how can I make a request or how do I auto renew my application that I, I use all the time? All those kinds of help desk kind of requests. Really, how do we like change that and really think about let's do that a little bit differently. Maybe we bring in some bots. Maybe we bring in a power app. Maybe we have an intelligent thing that's actually looking on your PC to determine if your network load or your CPU is running OK and automatically prompt the user, hey, it looks like your machine is not having a good day today. Why don't I open up a help desk ticket for you? So these kinds of self service things are are really becoming prevalent right now on how we can automate and make things more efficient as far as bringing in that intelligence to the user so they can feel like they can get their problem solved and on their way with what they were working on. Other things that you might want to think about are insights and recommendations and guided tours around. Hey, this is what's happening. This is what I see. So as you're building applications, really think about what are ways that we can guide a user to that next click or that next action or that next thing. So if you're doing a portal, if you're doing an application, people do not have time, do, nor do they want to go watch a training. They don't want to go through a week long training to learn how to use an application. 
What they want to do is open it up and figure it out, right? If I open it up for the very first time, how can you guide me through with a couple little boxes that say, hey, did you know that this is the settings button? Why don't you go take a look at this? Did you know this is your menu button? Why don't you go take a look at this? And oh, one more thing just to get you started. You know, this is where you need to go to do a search, right? Those key scenarios that you would see through your profile mapping and persona and journey mapping, those are all things that you might be able to help bring insights into. And then as users click that those um, elements, like let's say the settings, you can actually track how, what they're clicking on so that you know what is more popular, where you should spend more time and where maybe you need to take a look at. Maybe it's not getting as much usage as it should. So these are some of the, some of the elements that you can think about as you're starting to build out your customer experiences really thinking about what is the outcome that I'm going to get or gain by using or doing or implementing this particular application, whether it takes you 24 hours in Power Apps or it may take you six weeks or six months. And you do that with, you know, IIS or a dedicated Windows application. It doesn't matter what platform you use. Think about how it's going to impact the user and how you're going to be able to make change very quickly when the business needs change because remember now we're moving at the speed of business it doesn't get to drive the speed of business business is actually driving now it which is a little bit different than maybe 10 years ago so some other things that you might think about from this you know how can i you know really build my applications or think about how i do my applications there's another segment around you know customer insights and really thinking about how do customers interact and how can i get um, intelligence from what they're doing and how do I guide them into what I need them to work on or what I need them to do. Um, Dynamics is also a great application for this particular thing. You have over on the right, you have your actions. I can be in my mobile app, be a web app. I can be in person. I could be on a bot. Doesn't matter. And I'm going to leverage the Power Platform, Microsoft Teams. Maybe I have a, a, a dedicated mobile app that's integrated with Power Platform and Teams, right? You have that kind of front end interface. Maybe I'm even have an add in for Word or Excel, right? You have that automation and that process that says, hey, look, I am one click away from wherever you are. Click here and all of a sudden I'm going to start bringing in those insights. Remember we talked about that before. Uh, how do we bring in analytics and AI and machine learning to the table to say, now wait, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this is how you use the data. This is how we've mapped your usage. We're ingesting content from all these different sources and we're taking a look at your behaviors mixing that up with what you're trying to do and I'm actually going to start helping you get from where you are to where you need to go by maybe it's a pop-up that says hey I noticed you haven't uh, done your timesheets in three weeks why don't I get that started for you right or maybe hey I noticed that your expense reports aren't done in like two weeks why don't I help you get started right and it could say hey look here's all your stuff Here's your expenses you need to do. Click, 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 and then update the end, ending um, data store, such as the stuff on the right. We have web, we have mobile, point of sale applications, you know, geolocation information. We're doing things that are even um, interesting and creative around timesheets, right? Being able to record and track time and check in and check out and have a geofence so that if you're supposed to be working from home, you have to work from home. You can't work at the Starbucks. Right, so especially when it comes to financial information, you don't want those users out at Starbucks talking about, you know, your other people's social security numbers. It's, it's a very confidential thing. So how can we make sure that people have those guardrails to actually do the things that they need to do, but they're in a location where they're supposed to be either in the office or at home? So here's a, this is another set of ideas that you might think about as you begin building your applications. And again, your front end can be very quickly implemented using some of the Microsoft applications. So let's really think, you know, I just went through a ton of stuff. We can probably go do a PhD on all the things that we just talked about, but how does it really impact IT? And what does that mean to me as a um, manager, as a director, as an executive, even as a developer. Well, what we have to think about is all of these building blocks really come down to what experiences are we going to drive? What 
priorities on what experiences we're going to drive. Is it a technology experience where, hey, I need to change my password. I need to allow users to do that remotely because before they used to do it on a phone, they dialed 33333 three, 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 three on the um, office phone and it took them right to the help desk to the right location. But, you know, that's really tying up our external phones. How can we do, you know, governance and compliance and support to automate that particular process? Is it a technology thing that I need to really focus on? Or is it an enablement of technology? to users so that they can actually drive and do development and build out um, solutions that are going to help them move faster and get more information and more, um, uh, if you will, business focus right when they need it. So productivity would be how do I enable those things and how do I make sure that I'm tying those enablements to a persona, right? And then finally, we have the people experience, which is how do we get people excited about what we're doing? And many times applications, you do the first one, great. You do the second one, OK. And the third one we forget about. It's really about bringing in change champions, really about giving people um, an opportunity to teach each other instead of being taught, right? Because it'll get adopted a thousand times easier if you have that water cooler person teaching everybody, oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's so good versus having somebody from IT, hey, you have to go use this and then getting metrics around who is and who is not using the application so that you can go target those and try to understand why people are not and if you need to make a change. So when we're thinking about you know these three types of experiences, one of the things that we want to highlight is you know one of the things that we have to do is really help people feel like they can learn on their own. Right, learning has changed. Learning is um, different. We want things in short snippets. We don't want 10 hour long training sessions. And I really just want to know as a business user what to use when, right? Just tell me what I have to use. I'm gonna go click around and try to find it. If my next door you know, colleague has the answers to my question, I'm gonna go ask you know, that person first and we'll go figure it out together. And maybe the person across the way or, or a colleague you know, across the country that we know is gonna help us get there. But tell me what I'm supposed to use when, and then tell me what capabilities are turned off and why. So one of the biggest frustrations, especially around Microsoft Teams right now, is organizations are turning off functionality, but when the users go to their favorite search engine and they click on, hey, how do I record a meeting, but yet meeting recording is turned off, I'm gonna waste 35, 45 minutes trying to figure out, maybe it's just me, we go and I call my colleague, we're gonna figure it out, why, can, why can't we do that? I can guarantee you, I've been on no less than 10 calls in the last three months that people are like, how come I can't record? Well, you have recording turned off, right? And they had no idea. So if you're really, really thinking about when you do these low code applications and you do this kind of development, what you have to do differently is you have to say, hey, these are the features that are here and these are the features that are not. Because if you develop something in 24 hours, you don't have six months to go figure out every possible capability. You only have you know, a short amount of time to do exactly what's needed. So you let them know this is what it was done and if you want some more things, go fill out a feedback form. Why don't you do the suggestion box? All those kinds of things so that you can always have a backlog of what they can be done, but the user's expectations are set that says, this is not available. Um, where to go for business help? We call them centers of excellence. Um, it's different than your help desk support. So if anyone is an IT manager, a director that's watching this session, I would encourage you to um, find out where to go for business help or set up something for business help. And then um, where to go for demos and how to build out change champions and, and you know moderation and ownership of applications. And then provide them a journey. So even getting into what's next and lunch and learns and yam jam sessions and private previews and those kinds of things to really help you get to where you're wanting to go. So I know I've said a lot. I've talked about the technologies, I've talked about the personas, we've really talked about some capabilities. So if you do have any questions, please be sure to put them in the chat. I'll be happy to answer them as they come through. I don't see any just yet, but I know Rebecca will be marching that very closely. Again, if you have questions,
questions and if that you're watching this as a recording, you can always reach out to me on Twitter and I'll uh, try to uh, answer your question there as well. So one of the things that we talk about a lot when we're thinking about the power platform and the low code, no code is how in the world do I go enable my end users to go develop this themselves, right? You'll see all over Ignite sessions, especially today and tomorrow about, you know, hey, go do this yourself. It's just a couple of clicks. It's no, it's no big deal. Well, from an organizational perspective, you can't just turn all those things on, light them all up without understanding all of the details that happen behind it. How do you keep it secure? How do I manage it? How do I do compliance? All those things. So our recommended approach to enabling all these technologies is really what we call the crawl, walk, run method. Start small, figure that out, make sure people understand what's there and what's not. Then you add on more functionality, such as new tools, more users, best practices, templates, um, governance documents, you know, a little bit of more marketing sessions, you know, getting those change champions engaged. And then finally, when you're in the run stage, now you can actually have reusable components. Here's how we can help you build it faster. Reporting and metrics are completely embedded. Infrastructure security and processes are all there. So these three steps are really important for you as you enable your end users to help you understand and drive that platform driven community. Now, again, one of the things that we would recommend is that you bring up a separate what we call center of excellence around how do I questions instead of what we typically use IT support for, which is L1, L2 or L3, which is my thing is broken, please fix. Nothing is broken in these scenarios, and so you don't want to overwhelm your IT help desk. So if you bring on a group that we call a center of excellence where it says, hey, look, I'm going to come to you when I need to know how, how do I or what do I use when or where is this thing or how do I get enabled or is there training or how do I learn all those how questions and a COA can help guide the business so that everyone is using what they're supposed to and we don't have shadow IT. So we found some very, very good success. This is where a lot of our work is coming from within organizations who are leveraging COEs because they're able to make a difference faster um, to the organization and to businesses. So which brings up the great question of governance, security and compliance. Governance, security and compliance, it's a giant black hole. As you can see, lots of stuff impact security and compliance, but I'm going to leave you with just a few thoughts as you begin this journey. First, users have to understand what tools to use when they need to complete something. I know we've talked about this two or three times, but I can't stress that enough. When users don't understand, they do it their own way. They do it an old way. They do it inefficiently or they do it out of compliance. So making sure they understand what to use when is, is very important. Um, enabling what we call guardrails or bumpers to allow them to say, how do I complete my task without having to do shadow IT? So for example, if I'm going to go um, and I want to allow everyone to do bowling, for example, and I don't want to maybe have everyone bowl the, the ball down the, the lane. I want them always to hit pins when they get to the end. I don't want them to fall in the gutter. I don't want them to go in the next lane over. I don't want them to bounce it down the way. I want them to bowl. But if I put a ball in their hand and I say, OK, now go bowl the ball down the lane, they're going to look at it and go, well, what's this? What are these holes for? I don't know how to use this. So they kind of figure it out and then they kind of chunk it down the lane. Maybe it ends up in the next one. But if we provide them the proper guardrails to say, hey, let me put the bumpers up so that you can't go into the gutters. Let me give you the little slide so that you can just put your ball in the slide and it'll go right down and it'll show you how to do it. And once you're ready, you can take the slide out and bowl yourself, right? So really implementing guardrails, we have governance bots, we have security bots, we have enablement bots, we have password reset bots. All of these kinds of things are now at your disposable that can be implemented very quickly. And then finally, make sure that the proper controls are in place to really secure your assets without making it complicated. So what I mean by this is really secure my content, but don't secure my behavior. 
right? If you want me to be able to work on my phone and you want me to work on my desktop, don't make it so hard that it's easier for me to go use my own computer or grandma's computer or my own phone to be able to get my work done. If I need to get my work done, allow me to work and allow me to move, but don't allow me to send all the social security numbers, for example, to my friend, right? You're going to block those kinds of things. So secure the contents, not my behavior, and you'll find that users are going to gravitate towards wanting to be compliant. They're going to be calling, hey, I want to do this and I want to make sure I'm compliant. So that kind of shift is something that you can do once you give people comfort and confidence that everything is there and easy to use. So a couple of things that I do want to mention just real quick. Um, I want to show you where you can get some common tools and templates to help you get started on your journey. Right? I've said a lot of stuff and you're probably thinking, hey, how do I get started? And Microsoft does a really great job of helping you get there really quickly. So for example, in Teams, they have all of the huge list and it grows by the day, literally, of applications or what they call app templates that you can just literally lift compile, drop into your team, deploy it into your organization, and it's ready to go. It works just as you need it to. There's quite a few. You'll find um, the link here, so you can just copy and paste that right onto your browser, and it'll take you right to this particular example, and then all of these that are here. Um, there are many, many. We've deployed them lots of times, and since you get the code, you're actually able to modify it to your own needs. So let's say, for example, I don't want to create a new visit. Maybe I don't want this to be visitor management. I want it to be employee management. And maybe I don't want it to be just, hey, when you come into the office, but I want it to be to schedule a meeting. So all of these things you can take completely customize, and we've embedded lots of these different things and different solutions uh, to accelerate our ability to get them done quicker. Other things you can do are what are called um, power apps and they have there's quite a few of them out there they are in multiple different links there wasn't a single one like for teams but this is one that we actually use a lot which is the power app center of excellence starter kit it helps you understand from an IT perspective who's using what inside the power platform and it can be revolutionary I will tell you in our develop developer tenant we installed this thinking oh this is kind of cool let's install it see what happens our eyes opened we reorganized the security in our tenant i mean if there is a uh, application that you can pretty much click and get installed and go through the process you do have to follow the notes pretty exactly but if you do that it works beautifully and it can raise awareness we've even extended this for teams and for sharepoint and different things for customers the next one is around how do you do training? So we talked about that quite a bit. So this is a um, components for building in training applications and how do you do that in a, a new and innovative way? This is something that you could use as a starter. And then also if you wanted to do some bots, I do know there's quite a few, not just with bots, but um, there's adaptive cards, documentation and accelerators. So there's many, many things. If you just take a look at the Microsoft website, you'll be able to find those pieces. Um, just a couple more things. Um, this is really around pillars of success. How do we make sure that all of these things that you have implemented are going to be successful? And I'll give you our driving principle. One of these things is one of the things you'll want to do is what are your driving principles around your um, if you will evolution to the power platforms or low code no code solutions and our first thing that we think of is we have to be able to empower we have to be able to have the tools we have to have the right people we have to have the ability and the confidence that they are going to do great things right we're going to have conversations with our business we're going to have a great relationship and these things that 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 uh, encompass empowering is really saying hey look I trust you to do great things. I want you to do great things. I'm going to enable you and empower you to do those things. But the second thing is, is people uh, are part of the part of the equation, but data is also people and data is I think of as people in disguise, 
right? We need to listen to what the data says. If we properly track, data is going to start telling us where we need to go and where our gaps are. Remember earlier I said who's using what application and more importantly who is not, right? Allowing that capability of ease of access to data and making sure that we're intelligently bringing that data to the forefront is going to be important, but we also have to make sure that as the data is starting to talk to people and people are starting to ask intelligent questions to data, say for example in Power BI, it does need to be secure and compliant. Um, other things to do are we want to be instrumental. Before we were actually what I would think of as digital. Hey, I'm doing reporting, I'm doing dashboards, I'm doing bots, I'm doing portals, right? I'm all digital. But we want to take that now to the next level and say, no, I'm actually really being instrumental. I'm actually bringing decisions to play. I'm actually bringing in cognitive services, just in time connections. I'm actually intelligently bringing people together because I see something happening in the network or I see some event that you need to be part of or a meeting is happening and I think you need to join, right? It's really around bringing intelligence and the next level of uh, um, application and technology to play but it's being very smart about it. Remember at the beginning, it's not that we're being personalized, it's we're being individualized. How do you as a person, how are you reacting to your surroundings and the people around you and the data around you? And that's really the difference between being instrumental and being digital. Um, finally, you know, how do we make sure that we are modern? Um, one of the things is, is you have to be constantly evolving. I think of it as the Kaizen principle really making sure information and intelligence, we're staying up to date with all the latest things that are going on in Microsoft. We may not always implement all those things, but at least we're aware because if somebody asks us to develop something and we go, oh wait, Microsoft is gonna deliver that in two months. Let's not spend eight months developing it. Let's leverage that when the time is right. So really thinking about how do we build modern, but how do we build in a, a way that's going to always make sure that we're evolving and moving forward. Other definition of success really is creating something people love and get value out of and not that they dread using. It's not about what I'm bringing to play. It's not about the taxonomy. It's not about the data. It's not about the laundry list of stuff that might be relevant to your application. It's about how do we give them an experience and about allow them to feel connected to people, especially when they can't be connected without all the shenanigans that you have to maybe go through. So really defining what you think of as success is really important because once you have a definition of success, you have to actually measure that success. So there's a couple of things here. Um, one of the, the principles from Peter Drucker says, hey, you can't manage what you can't measure. And that is absolutely true. But you also can't if you don't know who you are and who your organization is and the customers that you're trying to benefit, you also cannot be successful because you can build the greatest thing in the world, but if nobody needs it and nobody uses it, it's 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 not helpful, right? You could have spent six months working on something else. So your success and the team success is really about what you're bringing to the table and how you're measuring it and defining what your outcomes and you're not saying, hey, look, I'm always perfect. You're actually saying, hey, I'm learning by doing. I'm going to go give you something. I'm going to learn by it. I'm going to give you something else we're going to learn. I'm going to give you more and I'm going to learn and I'm going to give you more and I'm going to learn. I'm not going to learn by failures. I'm actually going to learn by my outcomes and my successes because the things that aren't successful, I'm going to actually go work on those things. Or the things that are successful, I'm going to go do more of that. So really thinking about how you measure your success is important. And so here's a couple of slides around how Microsoft has some accelerators for you to measure some success and how you have a guide that says, hey, look, here are your success criteria. Here's your source. Here's how you're going to measure it. And here's a goal. And so this will help you align. Are you going to be successful with this application that you're building? And it doesn't take a lot, a lot of time to do. And then finally, how do you all how do you get surveys? A lot of customers, a lot of employees. I will raise my hand. I am too are I don't do a satisfaction survey, right? But if your organization does want to do satisfaction surveys, that's great. But we actually want to take that to the next level and let's do a satisfaction bot. So if my bot recognizes that I did something, I opened up a ticket instead of the, in the email of the ticket, hey, click here to give us feedback. It knows 
that the ticket was created and knows that help desk was able to resolve it, I pop open a message in Teams. Hey, I noticed you opened a thing in Teams. Click right here for this feedback, right? Now the system is being smart. It's actually coming to me and saying, hey, I need your feedback. So the great thing about this particular set of stuff here is there are great questions. There are great answers and you can convert them into a bot and do just what I suggested when a ticket is opened and then when it's closed so that you can get that feedback in a more proactive manner. And then finally, one of the things that we like to do to do a self check, did we actually get through the right stuff is we build what are called day in the life journeys and Microsoft has many, many, many of these in their website on the adoption site. So take a look at these journeys. They're very complete. They kind of give you a day in the life, kind of walking you through and really helping you figure out how can I actually implement this in such a way that it's actually going to be very useful because if I keep my, my focus too narrow, I may solve a teeny little bit of the problem, but if I would have thought just a little bit broader, I could have had even better results. So think about how you do day in the life. Take a look at some of these uh, scenarios that Microsoft has. It's really wonderful and they have quite a few that we leverage often. So in summary, um, I see there's a couple of questions. I'll answer those in just a minute. But in summary, here are some things to take away from this session. One is think personalized, think individual, think multi-channel, device agnostic. Don't build something for something people are not going to use. It's all about me really as the individual so really think that way when you're building your application as a user would i do could i do is this working for me and then two make sure it's contextual right i don't want to send that feedback form for that it support ticket when it's in the middle and i'm really frustrated right i'm probably not going to get the results i want right make sure it's actually at the right time with the right information and making sure that it's really empowering the staff to utilize and manage whatever it is that they need to do. So you don't want to give someone an IT uh, feedback form if they never open up tickets or you don't want to give somebody who's a salesperson that uses their phone all the time some form that's got a hundred thousand um, boxes on it that they have to click and navigate like for 25 minutes on their phone. Think about how they're using it. Think about the context they're using it and why that they're having to go to that particular application and what its purpose is. And then finally, you know, the next one, which I cannot stress enough, de-silo. So you, you saw my Microsoft diagrams, how we're encompassing the entire landscape of Microsoft 365. And even organizations are going even beyond that to include things like Salesforce.com and more and more cloud-based services or even on-prem based services de silo break down those silos really think about micro experiences how can i deliver this one thing that I, they need um, right now to help them manage their business it's going to save them time money and effort and then finally really make sure that we bring together a ubiquitous environment that's going to help them think about hey how do i work in relation to everything else the last thing i want is a hundred thousand apps on my phone right oh an app for changing my password and an app for this and an app for that and that for this and you know it's just like bookmarks all over again so really think about how people are going to use these things what that means to them what the collaboration tools are that you're going to leverage and making sure that they're all compliant on the right device with the right scenarios so with that i want to thank you um, for taking the time to uh, spend an hour with me. I know that I was competing with Ignite a little bit, but I'm hoping you found it useful. There were a couple of links and what I will do is um, I will give those to Rebecca and she will find a way to give you the links um, uh, either offline or in the chat. So I will work with her on that. And then um, if there's any other questions, I will um, be happy to take them and I will pass it back to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, that was fantastic. Oops. And let me just share my screen here. There we go. Let's do that. Sorry, little tech. Oops. That's not one. One second. Sorry, technical difficulties with the transfer of my slides. There we go. I'm up. Um, so yeah, so thank you all for tuning in. Again, as Suzanne mentioned, uh, we know that Ignite is happening currently as well, so we really appreciate you popping over to the reactor and checking out this um, session. Um, I dropped a few links into the 
chat box, um, our YouTube channel where we'll be uploading this recording, um, our survey if you have the opportunity to fill that out and submit. Just make sure that you take down the event code as well, which is 11651. Um, and then also just some learn links uh, through Microsoft in regards to additional learning opportunities on how to use some of these applications and um, so and so forth. Um, and then I think, um, yeah, one individual, Suzanne, had asked about also sharing the links that you had in your presentation. Um, as well, which we can certainly we can share on our meetup pages. We can drop it into the description on the YouTube. Uh, we can also potentially post it here on this chat. Um, for all of you joining us, thank you again. If you came through on one of our meetup pages, that's fantastic. If you haven't, definitely check out meetup.com and go to the Microsoft Reactor. Currently, while we are in a virtual uh, life right now. Um, we have events happening across multiple reactors, but we also have individual localized events um, which may not get posted on all of our pages due to time zone restrictions. But if you happen to be a super early morning person or a very late night person, you might want to go to our main Microsoft Reactor page, check out the calendar and look at different uh, locations and times for other events happening in the future as well. Um, again, the survey link just here. If you can please uh, submit, we do use those to develop future content and topics that we put out to our community and all of our events through the reactor are free. So definitely take advantage of that. Give us your feedback. Let us know what you'd like to see. Um, and then now if there's any other questions, um, I haven't seen anything come through. I've seen a few thank yous, which is wonderful. Thank you guys as well for tuning in. Um, I think that might be it. Suzanne, do you have any last words or otherwise we can call it? No, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. You all have a good rest of your day. Take care. Signing off. <laughs>